Hello everyone, welcome back to Feeding Curiosity. Well, we are going to be covering a bit on Joe's studies, actually, on moral reasoning. Um, and so, Joe, you had put together a PowerPoint, but it has not seen as much of airtime as you'd have liked in class and stuff like that. So I just thought, why not put it here on the internet and see if anyone else finds value in what uh, you put together along moral reasoning and uh, take it away. Yeah. I put this together, um, for our lab. So I'm in a lab here at Vanderbilt and we, um, got involved in a project that's kind of this cross disciplinary or interdisciplinary look at films, moral reasoning, uh, a lot of theory of mind kind of stuff. And I was asked to become kind of the resident expert on moral reasoning in part because our lab is more on the theory of mind side and attention perception where the other lab that is more tuned to moral reasoning and particularly how it interacts with films, they're at MSU. So they're on the other side of the country. Oh, gotcha. So we kind of wanted somebody that was around that we could <laughs> utilize to make sense of that bit in that particular corner of what we're painting, right? Uh, so over the holiday break, I worked on this for a solid month straight and then probably intermittently for another half of them, another couple of weeks when I got back and courses began up again. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a whole lot of time to present on it in our lab. It was kind of designed for them to some degree, but we major time constraints, understandably. And, um, so that kind of led me to having this kind of behemoth of a presentation and Nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah. So it's nice that uh, you, you brought this up. Yeah. I mean, I just didn't want the effort to go to waste. And I mean, just given what we've posted on Feeding Curiosity's website around some of the more in depth philosophical and psychological uh, subjects, I just thought there's at least a subsection of the audience that might find it interesting. Um, and you know, there's never su no such thing as too much information, especially when it comes to some of these more um, advanced topics. Yeah. And I'll, so I'll go over, I think there's four parts to this. Mm -hmm. uh, there are intermittent slides that have to do specifically with how these things might interplay with film. I'm going to skip over those because they're largely research questions designed uh, to spur uh, investigation in our lab. It's not, it won't pertain much to the lay audience, right? This is, they're not going to be brainstorming ideas with us. Yeah. That's um, so I'll just skip over that stuff, but otherwise here we go. Sweet. So moral reasoning starts with the genealogy of moral reasoning. All right, there we go. We're good. Cool. All right. So first up is Lawrence Kohlberg. He was largely influenced by Jean Piaget, who is a famous developmental psychologist who had a series of stages in human development. And those stages largely inspired Kohlberg to look at it in a kind of moral reasoning fashion. How do these stages play out? Are there stages in the ways that people morally reason? And a big innovation in creating these dilemmas, these moral dilemmas that asked people what should people, what should someone do in this situation? Why and why not? And then it wasn't that he was looking at whether or not the person was right or wrong, whether or not they got the answer correct. It was how, or even what their answer was exactly. It was more about how they justified their answer, right? So I'll, this scenario that I have pulled up here talks about a man named Hines and his wife is terminally ill, except there's a drug that could cure her. It costs too much and the pharmacist won't put the prices down and he's caught in his bind or he basically either has to consider breaking into this store to steal the drug in order to save his wife's life or not to. Right. So there's a clear question between protecting, uh, your wife or not being a thief. Right. So he has a series of stages that have emerged out of this. The first he. Each level, there are three levels. There's pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. 
Um, by conventional, he means really the conventional morality of your time, right? What your culture, whatever thinks. And so pre-conventional is before you've even, you know, even arrived at that. And that breaks down into two stages. So an obedience and punishment orientation. So that the reasons that these kids will give for why someone should or shouldn't do something and what decision they made is largely just to avoid punishment. <laughs> that's, that, that's the extent of their reasoning. It's just, we do whatever we do because I don't want to be punished for it. Stage two is a recognition that different people can, can have different opinions about what is worthy of punishment. And so there's a certain kind of bringing up there, a little bit of individualism and exchange being recognized in that piece. You see something like fairness emerging there. And then in the conventional level, you have good interpersonal relationships. This is something like the birth of a persona, right? The desire to be seen as good by others, that you do things more than just to avoid punishment to actually, but actually have a good reputation. Stage four, maintaining the social order. So this becomes more abstract now in the collection of interactions that you've had with people. You're able to pull out a series of abstract moral rules that need to be upheld. And these are largely the rules of your society. In a post-conventional morality, which requires sophisticated abstract moral reasoning, uh, most people just don't arrive there <laughs> in, in cult. <laughs> you, very few people get to a post-conventional morality. Um, stage five, social contract individual rights. So the, this idea is that there are laws and rules are that are designed to help groups of people, but they can still violate the autonomy of individuals. There's a certain recognition there um, of these rights and that these aren't infallible rights exactly, or I should say rules, not rights. Uh, the universal principles is the final stage. And it's one, it's something like one's conscience takes precedent over the traditional rules. Abstract moral and individual principles subordinate laws, rules, and traditions. The individual is prepared to defend their principles despite the risk of being ostracized or imprisoned. Now, he wouldn't use the word conscience exactly. It's more like you come up with an indiv entirely individual set of moral principles to which you adhere and you subordinate the traditions, rules underneath that. So I, I use conscience lightly. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So a big innovation was those moral dilemmas that he came up with. But a feature of the whole philosophy that he had was that it justified a secular liberal moral viewpoint. So he believed that role taking or perspective taking was fundamental to moral reasoning. Uh, so that's how you abstract out all the moral rules that you'll have is just by interactions with other people and taking their, their perspective, being able to take their perspective. Um, but it privileged peer relationships to hierarchical relationships where perspectives are much more difficult to take. Things like tradition, loyalty, and authority were downplayed. And that's because I, it's not hard for me to take my peers perspective. It is harder for me to take my bosses. Right? I don't, I don't have. I don't have his experience. I don't know what it's like to manage the store or whatever, because I never have. So to take his perspective is something outside the realm of my imagination in a way. And so that means that the kind of, the, the fact that he thinks that all moral reason is predicated on that means that the idea of even hierarchy is sort of removed from the equation. So a guy that came after him was Elliot Turiel. Uh, he developed a te technique that also wasn't dependent on articulation so much because you're asking kids complex questions. Th th the issue might not be that they can't morally reason. The issue might be that they don't know how to speak that well. <laughs> <laughs> They're just not developed no. enough to be able to reason out or give you why they behave the way they do. <laughs> right. So he just made yes-no versions of these. Mm -hmm. So they worry about it so um, for him, it's the same thing, though. It's morality is about harm and fairness, like Kohlberg. Uh, children should be left alone to discover these rules for themselves. Quote, morality is about treating individuals well, about harm and fairness, not loyalty, respect, duty, piety, patriotism, or tradition. Hierarchy and authority are generally bad things, so it's best to let kids figure out things out for themselves. That's from the righteous mind. 
by Jonathan Haidt, who I'm relying on quite a bit about this. The abstraction of moral principles out of peer relationships forms morality to purely rational endeavor. Experiences to rules to systems of moral thought and principles, all on a continuum of abstraction. All right. So there's some philosophical failings with this that are become pretty evident, I think. <laughs> and I can outline them in two parts. Um, one with his problems with hierarchy and the other with his problems with rationality. So we'll talk about Rousseau and Hobbes, or nature and culture. So Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, I, for the title of this, struggled a little because um, I need to contrast hierarchy with its opposite, which is anarchy. But to be fair to Rousseau, I don't think that what Rousseau would say is anarchy. That he advocates for anarchy. So and means without. Um, archon means in, I think it was Greek. Yeah, in ancient Greek magistrate or leader mm. right so it means out a leader but he wouldn't put it that way it's more like everybody's a leader of their own life he likes this free-flowing freedom mm. kind of way of going um so i changed and to pan things like pantheism pan means all or panacea which is a cure-all um one of my favorites is pandemonium which came from john milton and means place of all demons pan demon demonium yeah. <laughs> I never realized right. that's right. a really this word is even cooler than I thought it was. Right, isn't it? I, I love that. I thought I was like, oh, what neat. No. Then of course, like <laughs> Panopticon, right? Yep. We'll get to Germany and them actually a bit later. Um, so this is a place of all leaders, or I'll say all leaders instead of no leaders for the sake of Rousseau. Okay, so he lived from 1712 to 1778, and a little bit of kind of context i really don't believe this idea that you can take a perspective from nowhere and be objective i think that often people who think they're being objective just aren't aware of the ways in which their instincts and attention are pulling them in one direction or the other you're interested in something for a reason and if you're not aware of why if you oh, just feel that way i just i just am interested in that over something else well that means that there's some part of your unconscious that's steering you in that particular direction so i don't buy this total objective thing um, so it's helpful to kind of put these people, um, put their philosophies in the, in the context of their life. Okay. Rousseau's mother died nine days after his birth. His father and aunt raised him and his brother. His father ran into legal troubles and fled with Rousseau's aunt, leaving his sons in the care of a Calvinist minister, whose daughter, Mademoiselle Lambertier, left a strong impression on him. Uh, you can read about how he, she would spank him. And it wouldn't work because he start, came to really enjoy it. And he talks about this a lot. It's a, it's a very sexual thing for him. Oh, it's pretty wild. Oh, yeah, yeah. boy. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's a character. Um, as an adult, Rousseau trained to be a priest, then a musician, a copyist, then teacher. He found a lover in Louise Eleanor de Warrens, who became his benefactor. She left a strong impression on him as well. And uh, she would call him, I think, like her little one. And he would call her, oh, what did he call her? He might have called her, like, he might have called her Mobby. If no I remember. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Rousseau might have been the first simp ever. <laughs> He's definitely a character. Frederick <laughs> continues. <laughs> oh, no, it gets worse. But wait, there's more. Oh, no, I won't go any more into uh, Rousseau's sexual predilection. Okay. But. For, that, for those interested, you can find it in yeah, you find it in his autobiographies, uh, I assume. In his autobiographies, Pallia, Camille Pallia talked about it in Sexual Persona. It's interesting. Um, so he converted to Catholicism, I believe, for her for her sake. Um, and then back to Calvinism. Hmm. Uh, he criticized French for being an inherently unmusical language, then wrote an opera in it. He had five children with a maid and then abandoned all of them at a hospital, likely to die. Uh, he fled Geneva after a hostile outcry against du contrat social and eventually lived with David Hume until he became increasingly paranoid and irreparably damaged his relationship with Hume. He then wrote autobiographies until he died in 1778. So he moved around a lot. He did a lot of crazy things. His life was chaotic. With <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a stable personality. <laughs> he was definitely all over the place. 
So he lived a kind of philosophy of um, constant freedom and individualism and this sort of thing. Um, upon seeing uh, an advertisement for an essay competition from the Academy of Dijon, yes, the Dijon, as in where Dijon mustard comes from, I had to look it up, uh, on whether the arts and sciences had improved or corrupted public morals, Rousseau had a flash of insight. Humanity is good by nature, corrupted by society. Mm. So he had, is an insightful moment, right? It's not that he comes to, goes through a logical process. It's that he has this a, a moment of imagination, which you'll find is fascinating. In fact, the guy, I forget how to say his name, that I think it was boron, the chemical um, compound structure of boron. It might have been benzene. It was benzene. Uh, he was struggling forever to figure out what the structure was and then had a vision, I think he had a dream of the Ouroboros and then woke up and was like, I've got it. And then created it, figured it out, solved it. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. But for Rousseau, human beings are inherently good. Reason and society are not directed towards a moral conscience, but hijacked for the sake of power and domination and body in our institutions. He had a more, I'm going to butcher this, a more de so, soy, S O, excuse me, S O I, and something like self love, this is a, like the ability to have food, shelter, comfort, these kinds of things. Uh, and then on top of that, as societies of free individuals, all kind of islands on their own, begin to organize themselves into groups and hierarchies, he has a more proper, which I think is something like proper, but it, it, he means like vanity or status. In hierarchy, hierarchical society, one persona, a form of lie, according to Rousseau, is made to deceive others in service of a more proper which in turn teaches us that others lie to us. Man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. So he opens to contrast socio. Feels like he wants to go frolic in the woods. <laughs> it's Just, very much that, yeah. Like, that's what I'm like. Like, he doesn't want to deal with the things humanity has created. Or, yeah. or and so it's, he views them in a very negative attitude. He does. It's a strange thing. Hmm. It's like he sees all of society as kind of a, an oppressive, well, yeah. patriarch. The the patriarchal type feminists definitely take from a thread from Rousseau. All right, so a critique of Rousseau. Uh, so this the graph on there is shows the uh, share of violent deaths between non-state societies and state societies. And on the top there, that first half section, that's all non-state and the lower middle portion, those are state societies, which include uh, ancient Mexico as well. And even ancient Mexico is considerably less violent than non by sh share, like by population, uh, than non-state societies. So Rousseau's wrong. <laughs> the closer you are to a state of nature, after the more violent things seem to become. So the, the dangers of society are overstated. Um, uh, it's no coincidence that he was deified during the French Revolution. Turns out that if you're a revolutionary and you don't like your society, having a philosophy that says that society is the reason that all evil things happen is pretty convenient. <laughs> so, it makes it pretty easy to become the patron saint of being against it. Yes. They actually <laughs> transferred his body from England to the Pantheon in, in Paris. The revolutionaries did. Wow. They, they exhumed his body and brought it there. And then the Great Terror happens. And they cut off like 20,000 people's heads and go crazy. And, oh yeah, everybody, they could get their hands on. And uh, Camille Paglia says quite nicely, all roads from Rousseau lead to Saad. That's the Marquis de Saad, from whom we get uh, sadism. The word sadism comes from Saad. It should be sadism. Yeah, Technically. Is it like Sodom and Gomorrah, Gomorrah kind of? Is that where that comes from? Well, you, it's interesting you say that. That's a, that is a coincidence of history. That is okay. happy little. That was the first thing I thought of. <laughs> it's huh. nice. So check that out because I like Sodom. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Marquis de Sade, sadism. And right. the Marquis de Sade wrote a book called 120 Days of Sodom uh, that is 
fucking wild. <laughs> Crazy. It's, it's, it's basically pornography, but worse. It's worse. It's meant to be satirical. Like he makes, he just tries to find is make it as bad as you could possibly make it. So he's just trying it's, to be offensive as possible, effectively. It reminds me of, it, this is in some sense no comparison in their magnitude, but there's an episode of South Park where um, all the boys write a book called um, like the, something like the Tales of Scrody McBooger Balls. <laughs> and it's just, it's just the worst thing they could come up with. And nobody can get through it without vomiting. <laughs> it's the whole episode people throwing up like a paragraph into the book. That's fantastic. <laughs> and so that's they, but they all think that it, they all think that it's high art. Of course. And it's like, you know, it's so funny. Jesus. So it reminds me that, like it's meant to be kind of funny. Yeah. It's so, but he was in prison when he wrote that. I think for like, they're, they're like, this motherfucker is insane. Throw him in jail. And then during the <laughs> revolution, it's like they broke into the Bastille. And uh, he was like, oh, shit. So he hid his thing in the walls of the prison. He wrote his manuscript, hid his manuscript for that book in the walls of the prison. And then he got, like, sit, rescued by somebody. They pulled him out before they, like, I don't know, they lit the place on fire or what. A bunch of crazy people were coming in there. And some random dude found it and saved it. And basically, that's the only reason we have that book at all now. Wow. What a stroke of luck in history there for that one. Yeah, and he like he didn't even publish it originally until he didn't get it didn't get published till like nineteen oh seven. Wow. So you were just passing it down the family line and stuff. Almost like a hundred like, years. Yeah, something like that. Actually it was probably more than that, because if this was the French Revolution, this was like seventeen hundreds. Oh yeah, way but, longer than that. I don't know why I was thinking this is like eighteen hundreds for some reason. Yeah. Anyway, so in all the the sadistic craziness that occurs uh in Rousseau's name to some degree, uh out of that, in the in the Great Terror and the French Revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte becomes dictator of France. And so, great chaos, great order. Okay. So, Hobbes wrote a book called The Leviathan. Um, he's kind of, we're going to contrast him with Rousseau. He's the hierarchy guy. So he's a big fan. In fact, he'll advocate for a totalitarian monarchy. That's what he thinks that the solution to the world's ills are. Uh, he was a pro-loyalist. Oh, yeah. So uh, the pro-loyalist implications of Leviathan caused him to flee the English Civil War, right? Because he was talking about he wants a, monar a big monarchy, and then there's an English Civil War where they're like, we don't like monarchy. He's like, oh, shit, time to run. Uh, he was born three months before the peak of the Anglo-Spanish War. And uh, he, his mom actually gave birth to him earlier than she would have because she found out that it was like the day that he was born or something. She found out that this, the Spaniards were, had, the Spanish Armada had begun sailing to England and became so stricken with panic that she went into labor early and gave birth to him. And so he said in one of his autobiographies, my mother gave birth to twins, myself, and fear. And so for Hobbes, the state of nature, this is probably one of the most famous paragraphs in all of philosophical history. In such condition, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain. And consequently, no culture of the earth, no navigation or use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments, of moving and removing such things as required, as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And that's how he views nature. And I'm like, okay. I have to agree with Hobbes on this one. Yeah, I think it was Hobbes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually with both of them, just in different capacities. Same. They're both right. It just depends where you're looking. Right. <laughs> okay. So he has an idea of a social contract as well. Um, for him, it's an agreement between individuals and institutions thereafter. 
which constrain the natural barbarism of humanity in service of the cessation of terror, and therefore the product of humankind and not an omniscient God. That got him in a lot of trouble. Uh, morality and its reasoning are the products of aversions and appetites set in motion by a mechanistic universe. The object, quote, the object of any man's appetite or desire, that is it, which he for his part calleth good, and the object of his hate and aversion evil. So it's pretty straightforward. Thus, good and bad are largely subjective, and the collision of one's endeavors are states of war. Only by socially constructing laws which organize our passions beneath a state and a ruling sovereign may the state of natural war cease. For Hobbes, totalitarian mar monarchy, which he called the Leviathan, is an antidote to the brutality of nature and his fear of it. I kind of thought it was weird that he would give what's supposed to be your saving grace, which is a totalitarian state, um, that you would give it such an ominous name as the Leviathan. Yeah, that's an interesting take. Because the Leviathan does not strike me with a uh, warm and fuzzies, to put it lightly. It's not. <laughs> right, it's not an, it doesn't sound aspirational to me. Part of me thinks that his fear is so overwhelming in his life that he hopes to wield something as powerful as the Leviathan against it, mm. right? That wants something, you know, magnificent to rain down terror on all the things that scare him. Like, it's almost like you need something that's equally terrifying to beat back the thing that is, as the thing that terrifies you the most. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Um, Hobbes critique. He's wrong. <laughs> Hobbes forgets that human beings are natural. Thus, the chaos of nature applies to human nature, and our weapons against nature must be employed against us. Totalitarian states, the Leviathan, incur heavy enforcement costs exacted against people by people. Consider Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, Soviet Union, and the Holodomor, and Communist China, the Cultural Revolution. This is from, here's a little excerpt from the, about the Chinese Cultural Revolution. This is in the New York Times in 1993. The documents smuggled out of China by Zhen Yi, a prominent writer wanted by Chinese authorities for his work on Tiananmen Square, seem to offer a meticulous record of how Red Guards and communist officials in one province not only tortured their victim, victims to death, but also ate their flesh. The first person to strip meat from the body of one school principal was the former girlfriend of the man's son. She wanted to show that she had no sympathy for him and was just as red as anybody else. Woo! So, turns out great order also produces great chaos. These things go in both directions. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like finding the balancing point is the difficult thing. <laughs> And definitely making sure to, um, you need to ensure that your society doesn't become so corrupt that the only way to fix it is with tearing it all down and creating chaos or becoming totalitarian to hold everyone in order. Yeah. I think we're fiddling with that right now, but I'll leave that be. <laughs> Album critique is an enteodromia. You would go on to use this. So it means the running toward something that runs towards its opposite, the tendency mm -hmm. of extreme to produce their opposite. Okay, that order creates chaos and vice versa. This is evident throughout everything I've just said. Um, both Hobbes and Rousseau are falling prey to this. And the, the A solution is something like a synthesis or moderation of these two things. Uh, so now that we understand Kohlberg, uh, that Colbert accounts for Rousseau, right? Because he has the individualism, but he doesn't have the hi hierarchy. Um, we understand that he lacks Hobbes, the Hobbesian view in the hierarchical sense. So he seems to lead towards the Rousseau's portion. Whether he does that consciously or unconsciously, I don't know. This I don't know if he... I didn't go so deep into his influences to figure out if it be directly aligns with Rousseau in an explicit way. But it seems that the philosophy takes out a Rousseauist bend. Okay, but he also has a rationalist problem. 
Kohlberg is a very big rationalist problem. Part of the reason we're spending so much time in Kohlberg, by the way, is because he was staggeringly influential until very recently. <laughs> I was just say his, his like stages that he had seemed pretty self-evident even in today's modern stuff you see. Yeah, it's or really elaborated. He, that kind of way of thinking about this, I think in part was very pervasive. Not only because it was a good theory and it seemed to work out pretty well and people liked it and it made sense, um, but for two reasons um, that align with this kind of thing, which is that it, it's that its abstract nature, I think, aligns intuitively with academics, right, who are doing this kind of research. But also these academics are largely um, Rousseauists themselves. And so again, it just, it fits onto that onto them in a way hmm. and only till re in fact this has been a problem that's been brought up across the moral reasoning psychology people is that it tends to be that um they view l like liberal or democrat view the liberal or democrat view as being the natural view and conservative or uh republican political views as being an aberration, as being the thing that needs to be explained, whereas their view is perfectly rational and yeah, reasonable. Like it's self -evident like, how do we, or something? Right. It's like, we're the natural ones and they're, they have a neurosis. What is that about? Hmm. It's really treated like that. It's, it's, uh, I think it's large, it's actually appalling. I think that it's cheap and it's just so see-through. It's so transparent. It's like, oh my God. That's, I mean, that is the perfect breeding grounds for a, a dog to form, which is never yeah. good. <laughs> it actually be in there, all right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, though I haven't seen too much of it here. I've seen a bit of it. It's around. But... Yeah. It depends on where you go, probably, but. Yeah, I don't, I don't hang out with anybody, so what the hell do I? <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, so on to utilitarianism. Uh, utilitarianism. So. Jeremy Bentham is another philosopher. Uh, he's the founder of utilitarianism. For him, pleasure is good. Pain is bad. Net pleasure, so pleasure minus pain, is utility. It's whatever that equation is. And maximizing utility is good. Pretty simple. Right? So the most good, the most utility for the most individuals across the longest period of time, sweet. So it's a form of arithmetical hedonism right? you have to do the arithmetic john stuart mill who came after him was raised as a benthamite he came to really dislike him he thought that bentham was entirely uh un he, that he shouldn't even be considered a philosopher because of his staggering lack of like social abilities he was not a rounded person and uh height goes into this and talks about how um a lot of people have hypothesized that bentham was autistic Oh, or like wow. an ass, it's like an extreme systemizer, but was horrible with people. I mean, like, it kind of makes sense even just by the way you put the, uh, the bullet points here of just how much he enjoyed just black and white. Yeah. One of the things is, is that with Bentham's philosophy too, is it's like, if what's good is pleasure, and that's what you reduce goodness down to, then the only good that people have is the degree to which they can give you pleasure. You can derive pleasure from those people, right? So it makes them, they're a means to an end. And so you can see how that exploited it very quick. And it's understandable why it is that people wouldn't like that. <laughs> yeah. If that's what you believe, then the, it's <laughs> like, and why would he ever show up for you, by the way? You know what I mean? Yep. Why would he? I mean, I guess only to increase the, if he's making a gamble on you being able to give him pleasure in the future. That's a, that's a thing too. It's like, unless you enjoy staying, sitting with somebody at their deathbed, then why would you do it? Because you're not going to be able to drive any pleasure from that person because they're going to die. Why mourn? Why do any? Yeah. I mean, that kind of paints even more that he might've been autistic just considering it's it's way too reductionistic. Right, it's, like you're reducing people down to, are you know, are they a GDP to producing element? Yes or no? 
know what I mean? It sounds so like no one would ever agree with that. <laughs> now, John Stuart Mill remains a utilitarian, um, but he posits higher and lower pleasures. He is his life is a perfect example of the meaning making process. Mm. He's raising anthemite. He goes out into the world. He falls into this terrible depression while pursuing pleasurable things. Right? So if pleasure is good and that's the path to the good life, and it turns out that you still become crazy depressed, well, one, something about the pursuit of pleasure um, actually doesn't necessarily arrive you at the good life. So it's under that just the fact that you're depressed is undermining your entire belief system. Um, but he also found that pleasure couldn't get him out of the depression. He was very concerned about this. So this is this becomes an existential crisis for him. Hmm. And the way that he gets out of it, the, way, the thing that cures his depression is poetry. He oh. starts reading poetry and he's like, oh, wow. And so he, he posits the idea of higher and lower pleasures, that you can have something that's above the simple, uh, delicious food, as good as it is. You know, the simple pleasures. There's something more poetry in the arts and these things. And so he adds a dimension of complexity to his utilitarianism um, that remains prevalent. This, it's still huge that this whole ethical philosophy is still huge. There's a ton of utilitarians out there. Okay, so a critique of hedonism, period. So Robert Nozick, the famous libertarian philosopher, uh, had a, this idea of the pleasure machine to critique this. He's like, if you could just plug into a machine and you would just feel pleasure all the time, right? For, just for a turn, the highest pleasure. Would you do it? And most people will say no. That, no, I would not do that. Right? So if we maximize utility, most people, when they think about what they would even want out of their life, they wouldn't even go with that. But we have a real life example to really put drive this home. So in 1986, a 48-year-old woman, former opioid addict and alcohol addict, opioid and alcohol addict, was given an electrode implant in the right thalamic nucleus ventralis posterolateralis. Okay, good. That's the end of the word. That's it. Part of your brain. Uh, Appreciate with erotic sensation to combat chronic pain syndrome. You can see that the doctors didn't want to give her opioids because she was an addict. Yeah. She's like, okay, we're going to put this implant in there. She's got this terrible pain. We're going to help alleviate it in that way. Well, <laughs> soon after insertion, this is a quote from the study. Uh, soon after insertion, the patient noted that stimulation also produced erotic sensations. Now, sexual arousal was prominent. No orgasm occurred with, a brief, with these brief increases in stimulation intensity. Despite several episodes of paroxysmal trail to heart problems and the development of the adverse behavioral and neurological symptoms during maximal stimulation, compulsive use of the stimulator developed. And it's most frequent to patients self-stimulated throughout the day, neglecting personal hygiene and family commitments. A chronic ulceration developed at the tip of the finger used to adjust the amplitude dial, and she frequently tempered with the device in an effort to increase the stimulation of the amplitude. At times, she implored her family to limit her access to the stimulator, each time demanding its return after a short hiatus. Compulsive use has become associated with frequent attacks of anxiety, depersonalization, periods of psychogenic polydipsia, and virtually complete inactivity. Wow. Yeah. I have so many questions, because one, why would you do this to a person who's already got addictive behaviors? Two, <laughs> oh yeah, they fucked this one up. <laughs> like, there's so many, so many reasons this could have gone sideways. <laughs> oh yeah. But my god. It's pretty wild. It's and yeah. things we used to do back in the early 1900s. <laughs> right. So the question with that, <laughs> this, this was in 1986. This is not that long ago. Now that I'm looking at it again, I thought this was a lot okay. earlier. <laughs> yeah. 1986. Wow. So the question there is, is that the good life? Absolutely not. Right. Well, maybe maybe the, for her in the short term, but clearly not in the long term. Yeah. This is a nightmare, I would say. No, oh, that's interesting. Now a deeper critique. This is impossible arithmetic to be doing. This is a really common critique of utilitarianism. Hmm. Not just Bentham's style, but also um, in general. In order to tread the right path, one must calculate its utility. However, reality is chaos. 
The modern, quote, the modern study of chaos began with the creeping realization in the 1960s that, that quite simple mathematical equations could model systems every bit as violent as the waterfall. Tiny differences in input could quickly become overwhelming differences in output, a phenomenon given the name sensitive dependence on initial conditions. In weather, for example, this translated into what is half-jokingly known as the butterfly effect. The notion that a butterfly stirring the air today in Peking can transform storm systems next month in New York. That's uh, from the book Chaos by James Glick. It's very good. Um, this makes calculating utility in the right path impossible. Everything is in such constant flux that to know what action you should take if you're trying to make the good action, you, you can never know. It's all changing all the time. You can't do the math too much. Okay. So how do we build back up from here? So we've kind of annihilated. We would say we, we didn't annihilate Colbert, but we really, we showed where it's lacking. And now the question is, how do we think about morality? How do we think about moral reasoning under these conditions? Is there a way of accounting for something like intuition instead of rationality? Is there a way for accounting for hierarchy instead of just fairness and care? I think we'll maybe want to do this in two parts, do this whole thing in two parts. So maybe I get through the philosophical stuff. We get to moral, um, the moral foundation stuff and then do part two another day. Works for me. Okay. So a little bit more philosophy. So we're going to talk about pragmatism. I would and build up from there to get to a moral, a justification for moral reasoning, the moral foundi moral foundations. Okay. So reality is coincidentia oppositorum, which means the coincidence of opposites. Nicholas Cusados or Nicholas of Cusa, who was born in 1401, the German Catholic cardinal, philosopher, theologian, jurist, mathematician, and astronomer. He developed the least imperfect name of God. Quote, simultaneous art, yeah, this is from Webb, but a really good description. Simultaneous unfolding of oneness into multiplicity and the unfolding of multiplicity within the one. The idea that this one maximum thing, whatever it is, is infinite. You can't go beyond this. It's constantly, whatever the one whole is, is folding into all these diverse little pieces that then themselves decay and fall back into the one. And it, it just demonstrates, it, I think is a very appropriate way of looking at reality as such, which really kind of demonstrates the, the constant flux of reality. So pragmatic definition of truth then is much different than the materialistic um, object ontological view of truth that most people hold, which is that what is true is the sort of stagnant thing. Um, the dynamic flow results not in a, a object ontology, but a process ontology. Quote, process theorists generally reject the notion that everlasting substances are the most basic constituents of existence and argue instead that what appears to be enduring entities are really temporary stabilities and unfolding processes. They often reject the grounding assumption a much analytical philosophy that what is real is what is pure, independent, or undulterated. See, that view is pure, independent, and unadulterated is looking at things like pure objects, like they're building blocks that the universe is built out of, that is constructed from, where the process ontological view says that, no, 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 th those objects, those objects are processes. Nothing is stable. Right. And then objects are a matter of relative tempo. And so if I can look at this chair that is so clearly an object intuitively by my perceptions, and I could record it from the moment of its assembly, from the moment that they pulled the material out of the ground, organized it, you know, smelted it, whatever, threw it together in a factory. And I sit in it and here it is. And then one day it ends up in a field somewhere and the rain comes and it slowly decays. If I could watch that on a time lapse, 
I would see that this thing is a process. It's flowing just as much as water, but it flows at a rate that's much slower. And that it's the fact that it, that it slows at a rate or lives at a tempo low enough relative to my rate of tempo that it appears to me as a stagnant thing. That it's an object in that sense, but not an object in a fundamental. And objects break down into two different subcategories. There are objects that can help you, and those are tools. And there are objects that can hinder you, and those are obstacles. Okay, so true statements about any object are dependent on where it is in the process, its capacities at that point in the process, its potentials, where what its future capacities are. Um, put simply, things are dependent on their context. A true statement is more or less depending on how long the statement remains the case, right? I can say that this chair uh, can hold my weight, but what I'm really saying is that this chair can hold my weight at this point in time, <laughs> and that eventually this chair won't exist. <laughs> even, to say, even to say this chair exists is a might is a minor truth and that it will only be true insofar as the chair exists. It's interesting, like just the quotes and how the, this is framed, comparing this to the contemporary philosophers, they were so much more sure of their stances, whereas these, this person in particular feels so much more, um, humble. <laughs> In, in the fact that, you know, society is going to ebb and flow and change and it's making a definitive statement now is going to be wrong in not too, not too distant future, likely, or tweaked in some way. It's an interesting thing. I mean, this comes from a bunch of people. So Heraclitus is the big guy from way back in the day. Okay. He's the guy that held that um, no cool. man steps into the same river twice mm. because he's not the same man and it's not the same river. Like that's, that's him. Um, Alfred North Whitehead. I haven't read any of him yet, but he's another more contemporary philosopher that went over this. Um, I'm pulling from, um, this guy named Francis Highlighten. I think I say his name right. Uh, but I'll, I don't actually quote him in this or anything, but I've read a bunch of him. And then also this is, uh, Josephson Storm, uh, who wrote a book called Metamodernism and he goes over this in there. Um, therefore, true statements are hierarchically arranged depending on their functionality across huge expanses of time in varying contexts or breadth and depth. Humans do not have objective truths. We have hierarchically arranged approximate truths. Quote, the intellect is related to truth as a polygon to a circle. The inscribed polygon grows more like a circle the more angles it has. Yet even though the multiplication of its angles were infinite, nothing will make the polygon equal the circle. It's oh my nickel. God, it's a limit. It's calculus. That's it. <laughs> he just... Re <laughs> yeah, Nicola, yeah, Nicholas Acusa was a big geometry fan. Though <laughs> no, I, I, I think he, he knew um, Isaac Newton. He met Isaac Newton oh, and didn't like... <laughs> I, know, that, that, I might be confusing him now for... It might have been Hobbes that met Isaac Newton. Okay, that may, that would make more sense. I think the time is better on that, yeah. But yeah, he's a big math, but uh, Kuss is a big mathematician. So he's all into that. And in fact, in this, his book on learned ignorance, there's a bunch of mathematical comparisons where he's talking about lines and he's just drawings of circles and crazy angles and shit. I'm like, I got you the first time. <laughs> he's <just laughs> drawing the example for you though. <laughs> So the, the, to flesh out that idea a bit more, what makes something true is whether or not the statement corresponds with reality, but because reality is always in flux, um, what things are more or less true are those things which map onto a persistent pattern in reality, yeah. those least changing things of, of nature. And so gravity is a big fucking truth <laughs> because it just, it's just a constant, yeah. right? Even outside of the context of our planet, there's gravity in that manifests itself in different ways all over the place. But gravity itself means a major league truth. Um, but this chair by comparison is a minor truth. 
peewee baseball. <laughs> like, get it that way. From quote, all that is necessary to have knowledge of the social and natural world is for the rate of knowledge gain to be larger than the rate of change. That's so that's how you that's knowledge. Statement. You have to increase your knowledge at rates faster than the changing of knowledge. I think we're, Those at, we're in danger of upturning that one. Yeah, well, we're we're <laughs> we're deconstructing our entire schema, the entire which is to say the entire accumulated knowledge system of the Western world is being decomposed. Which means that we're gonna decon we're going to decompose at a rate that's faster than we can accumulate knowledge. We're trying to start from square one again. It's a very bad idea. You I think there's a healthy form of of deconstruction. But you have to understand that deconstruction isn't a good thing in itself. You should deconstruct deconstruction and then see where you go. No, that's an <laughs> they don't do that. And the, <laughs> uh, the reified postmodernist woke types, all about deconstruction, they do not touch their holy symbols. They don't right. touch their, yeah. they don't deconstruct their thing. So, okay, so those truths that change at a rate slower than our physiological rate of change are adapted to. So if some feature of reality is persistent, remains unchanging, moves at a tempo slow enough compared to, compared to our rate of evolution, then it will be accounted for by our bodies hmm. that we adapt to it. So we are nature's hypotheses of herself. We're a model. Our body is a model of reality. It's an embodied hypothesis about nature's structure. Human social dynamics are comprised of such patterns. Right? What if there are unchanging patterns of human social interaction? Are not unchanging, but the change in a rate that's slow enough that we adapt into the social patterns themselves. Those patterns of behavior that increased the likelihood of human survival over grand expanses of time settled into our biology. In other words, we embody truths about social, human social interactions. These embodied truths behave as moral foundations upon which our reasoning rests. A pragmatic definition, definition of truth might be something like this. Those truths, oh, excuse me, pragmatic definition of good. Those truths most consistent across time pertaining to the human social environment are the most good. Free while. Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's very differentiated, but also rooted in evolutionary theory, even. Um yep. well the American pragmatists, guys like um C. S. Pierce and uh he was like the big psychologist. What was the varieties of religious experience? What was I'm tired. <laughs> Four will know. Yeah. Somebody will talk about. <laughs> anyway, those guys were American pragmatists. There's a book called uh, The Meta Physical Club. Oh, by yeah. I've heard of that one. It was about them. Um, They were all about this because they're the pragmatists and they were like, whoa, they were doing this kind of philosophy work. And then Darwin came out with his stuff and they were like, oh, that's what we're talking about. That right there. So it was like right in time in cult in the development of our culture in two different huh. places, same ideas popped up. So like philosophy started talking about pragmatism and uh, evolution started, Darwinian evolution emerged. Wow. It's like there was just and enough information finally bubbling to the surface where people were like, wait a minute, there's something right. we're missing. <laughs> right, there's something under the surface here. And I really like the idea of defining the environment not as a stagnant thing, but as a constantly moving thing. And that the slowest, the simply the slowest parts, slowest moving parts of the environment are those things that we adapt to. And that they be, I like the embodied hypothesis idea. Yeah. It reminds me of like why like Hobbes and, and uh, Rousseau effectively put too much of their own life experience into their theories like they couldn't see beyond it in more general way of like okay how do other people live 
because they were, I mean, effectively lived in chaotic times, like most people do, yeah. but because they th saw their life as being emblematic of something, they couldn't divorce their experiences or their thoughts from so to something more general, even though they thought yeah. they were. Well, it's strange because I think everybody does this. Yeah. That everybody's philosophy is a reflection of their psychology, right? And it's just an inescapable thing. I think the way to deal with that is to become more conscious, more conscious, hmm. both of yourself, of the world, and then honestly express it. And then, then it'll be a more fleshed out philosophy insofar as you as a person are right. more fleshed out, you know? And they, they were just so fixated on their particular problems. It's really obvious, I think, actually it's kind of obvious with both of them, but it's definitely obvious with, um, Hobbes because Hobbes is so terrified all the time that of course you want some, the hammer to crack down and to relieve him of this thing. And then he creates an incredibly sophisticated, seemingly rational philosophy on the top of that, but it was directed by his intuition. Yeah. They are. Which leads us to this. And, um, we'll leave it at that for now because <laughs> we're just about an hour. So it's perfect timing. So <laughs> if people enjoyed this, I hope you did. I definitely learned some new stuff. And I mean, just to see all of this kind of put together in a, um, in more of like a categorization of all these different philosophers and understanding how their ideas evolved or emerged, I think is important because it's kind of, I mean, they talk about so much in their different books that can be very, very dense at times that yeah, yeah. I think it's important to kind of pick one aspect of it and then just be like, okay, so what did they actually have to say about this very specific thing? Kind of, you know, slicing off a tiny piece to, to really get a hold of it. Yeah. And it's for me, because this is a reflection of the way that I think <laughs> and, and the way that I think is in a, um, process ontological pragmatic way and so for me i don't want to i can't take any of these individual philosophers or psychological thinkers like kohlberg as a singular object detached from context that rather that they're at a place in the process of cultural development and i want to know where their ideas came from how they emerged what are the underlying assumptions that he's going on because one of them is Rousseauist and another is rational and they're both, they both have their problems. So if you can understand where his, his intuitions are coming from and what the problems of those intuitions are, then you can begin to see how he's going to go wrong. Yeah. And that, that leads us down the path to be able to make a better theory. Right. Exactly. You can see the blind spots and fill them in. That's all we can Which do. lead. Right. More yeah. fun. And that leads us to part two whenever we get around to it because we're going back to reality tomorrow. So, <laughs> wow, indeed. Well, everyone, thank you all for tuning in. I hope you learned something. And uh, if for whatever reason there's another philosophy or psychology major who is listening to this, uh, feel free to chime in and give us any other pointers, feedback, um, additional rating, whatever. I'm really curious what other people have to say about this topic because it we probably barely scratched the surface all things considered all right